Uh, thanks everyone for showing up uh, tonight for this webinar. Uh, in Canada, we've done uh, two or three webinars for our officials here, our referees. And I find it very, very nice that uh, we've extended the invitation for coaches and players because uh, yes, we can call uh, sometimes a good game, sometimes not, but it's good to have the same foundation when we uh, see a wheelchair basketball game. That way we can have a conversation about uh, the same stuff, which uh, sometimes is a bit different if we look at one way or the other with the officials. Okay, it's a presentation. Uh, basically over the years, I've gathered the video and uh, I've started to, uh, every tournament we go to as uh, international referees and now national referees, we have a little uh, conference like this with all uh, referees to go over uh, basic stuff about contacts, uh, traveling, or any situation we think would be important in the tournament. So in this, uh, for this webinar, we're going to specifically talk about wheelchair basketball, the principle of contact. Uh, from, for some players and coaches, it's going to be just putting words in some things they already know. Sometimes it can clarify stuff. And for others, it's going to be a refresher. And it, it could also be completely new stuff. I know when I was playing able body basketball, I thought I knew all the rules until I started refereeing, where I was 100% sure I didn't know all the rules. And even today, as a referee, I don't know all the rules. So don't worry about that. Uh, for those who, who don't know me, my name is Sebastian Gauthier. I'm a referee. I've been refereeing since uh, 1990. Uh, I started uh, I started refereeing uh, wheelchair basketball in 1990 at the same time that I did able basketball. Uh, I got my international license in 95. I was a referee coach for IWBF since uh, 2013 participated in five Paralympic Games and uh, also have been a referee a coach for many, many uh, tournaments in the Americas and here in Canada. I was an AB basketball player. I played the very minimum in a wheelchair, but I think I get the point. I, all, I still coach. I don't play anymore, but I still coach. So I have a feel for players and coaches uh, when uh, when I referee because uh, my kids do play. So I've, I know what they feel also when they're playing. So I think it's important for a referee to gather all this information. The presentation we're gonna look at today is based on two very important uh, book. And uh, I encourage everybody to, lead, to uh, read those books. Those are the, for now, the 2018 or 2020 IWBF official wheelchair basketball rule and the 2011 principle of contact in wheelchair basketball by Russ Duell. Those are the fundamentals in order to understand wheelchair basketball. And I know, I know referees that have never read, well, one of the two or the two, and it's very, very important to understand the rules to, to read the, those two. Uh, the principle of contact has 92 pages. So it's for sure we won't be able to see everything in, the, in those 59 slides we're gonna see today. So that's why we're gonna concentrate on article 33 of the IWBF book, which is related to the principle of contact uh, by Russ Jewell. And, uh, because there's 92 pages, we cannot go over everything. So we're going to concentrate today on four, the four general principles that are the base of wheelchair basketball that I think that are the base. In today's presentation, we'll uh, see first a little bit of terminology so that we can have uh, the same language when we meet each other for our next game. Uh, we'll see the four basic principles of contact and uh, we'll have a little challenge at the end where you can identify which principle we're talking about. 
Uh, during this presentation, uh, starting at slide 22, we'll have the videos, a lot of videos. It's important that you don't look at what the referee called in certain situation, but you go and look at what principle you're looking at and what would be your call, all right? It's possible that the video you're gonna see that the, the call was incorrect. It's possible because I have the videos that come from uh, 2012 and on in time. So I will try to keep this under an hour. <clears throat> uh, it's important to use the same language. So let's start right away. Whoops. Let's start right away with abbreviation we're going to use during this presentation. Uh, <clears throat> already you've uh, heard me say couples of abbreviation. Uh, wheelchair basketball, WB, legal guarding position, LGB, uh, on sporting foul, technical foul, AB basketball refers to able body basketball. FIBA basketball is the International Basketball Federation for Able Body. And IWBF basketball, it's the International Wheelchair Basketball Federation. Okay, the pat of a player. Okay, the pat is really the side of the chair, not the wheels. That's the main important thing here. <laughs> it's back and forth. So forward or backward is the pat of a of a chair, all right? We see here clearly that the wheels are not included in the pad of a player. So it's important to know that when we're gonna, if we wanna decide if a chair uh, has covered the pad of an opponent, we need to know what is the pad. So here we have it. Other thing we need to know is the, the vocabulary we need to have in common is the breaking area and the breaking distance, okay? The breaking distance is this, this distance that a moving player needs in order to be able to stop. Usually between one chair length and two chair length, never more than two chair length, it's in the rule book, but it can be if the player is not going very fast, it's, it can be under a chair for him, the breaking distance. Okay, the braking uh, speed is a big factor in this. Uh, the the braking area is the space right in front of the chair. That is given by the chair lengths he needs to stop before contact occur. Okay, that's the braking distance. Converging paths, real easy. Uh, the converging paths is uh, to, to uh, players that are going in the angles that the path are gonna meet, all right? What's important to know is that this is a converging path. <laughs> Two players are going and they're not changing any direction, okay? Because it's the difference between uh, crossing the path and converging paths. It's two different rules and the referee has to ident identify if somebody changes direction or not in order to make the correct decision on a call. We see here another converging path. You see now the, the two paths are converging at a 90 degree angle. <clears throat> now the eight is not going towards 11. So this would be a complete other principle, the head-on collision that, uh, that would, would be a different complete sets of rules that would be applied differently. There is no change of direction again. Now covering the path. If a player has covered the path of an opponent, he has established a legal guarding position in the defender's path, okay? If he does that, he is considered to have given the offensive player time and distance that, that's very, very important to know. <laughs> Let me, oops. Okay. <clears throat> the path can be covered with any part of the wheelchair. It can be the back wheel, front wheel, sideways, front ways. It's different from uh, able body basketball, where in order to have a legal guarding position, you need to be facing the person with the ball 
in wheelchair basketball, this does not exist. The only thing to have a legal guarding position you need to have is to have covered the path of the opponent with the ball. The angle can change, but it's still the same thing, all right? Players can wheel in backwards or frontwards. There's no difference for, the, for this, all right? When you cover the path, you have given time and distance, frontward or backward. Now we see parallel paths. That's very important to know. Parallel paths are the basic before crossing the path that we're gonna see after. Crossing the path involves two opponents traveling to, uh, close together, closer than breaking distance at approximately parallel paths in the same direction. A crossing the path situation occur, <coughs> you, uh, sorry, occurs when one of these players changes direction and turns across the path of the opponent. Okay, that's, that's one of the artist rule to apply for a referee, that with converging paths. That's why we're gonna look at those two uh, rules tonight. We're gonna explain it further in the webinar as we go. And the last thing we need to have to judge correctly crossing the path is to know terminology when we pass rear axle. We teach our referees always that we need to know where their rear axle is. So that's another terminology that we need. Okay, we'll go right in the four principles we're gonna look at tonight, which are guarding a player who has the ball, guarding a player who does not have the ball, screening, and the last one we're gonna look at is crossing the path. Let's start with the principle guarding the player who has the ball. We have uh, a more severe, uh, a more severe rule for a player with the ball than a player without the ball. They're good, that we're going to see after, uh, and it relates also that uh, the player with the ball cannot stop as quickly as the other one because again he's not touching his wheel. That's why we need to cover the complete path when we're talking about the player uh, who has the ball. To obtain a legal guarding position, the player must cover the path of the player with the ball. All right, in this photo we see here, the player has completely covered the path of the player, so he has a legal guarding position. Any contact after that would be the responsibility of the player with the ball. Or he can stop in part of the path, but give time and distance to the player with the ball in order to avoid contact. In that case, we see red four has established a legal guarding position because he stopped in the path after the breaking distance or the breaking area of blue five. That's, a, that's the two possibilities for guarding a player with the ball. There are no other possibilities when we're talking about uh, guarding a player with the ball. Okay. Guarding a player who has the ball. In this example, blue 13 fails to cover the path and she also fails to give time and distance to white 10 to stop. Therefore, it's a, a blocking situation. So what we teach our referees to look at is to identify what's going on. Is it uh, crossing the path? Is this converging path? In this situation, we see converging path, a player with the ball and a player that fails to cover the path of a player. Hey, Seb, uh, just a yes. question. Uh, if, you, if you want to go back just to that one, I had a question from someone. Uh, uh, just, uh, I know this is obviously animated, but so 13 would have to be further up the path to basically uh, 
uh, cover the path. Exactly. And we can see it's not the wheels that count. See, if 13 would be just a little bit over so that the front of her chair could cover the path right here of white 10, right. we would have a, a charging call. In this case, the path was not covered and time is distance. One of the two situations were not given. So we have a blocking situation. We'll see, uh, we'll see this in video right now, okay? Uh, <clears throat> slide, slide 22, everyone. Uh, Sean just put it on, so you'll get a chance to look at it also. Let's see if you guys can see it here with me using it. There's going to be a replay of the of the file, so you can look at it more. So look at the pad of the chair, converging pad, trying to achieve a legal guarding position. We can see that none of that was done. OK, I'll stop it right here. Hold on a second. So she tries. Remember, white as the ball. So in order for 13 to have a legal guarding position, she needs to cover the pad completely. If we'll talk about later if she doesn't have the ball, but right now, even though 13 was there first, she doesn't cover the pad and she did not give time and distance. So we have a blocking foul, a blocking situation. In the, in the next video, take a look at white 15, Mr. David Hang, as he gives just an extra little push to place himself in the breaking area of blue 15 with the ball. At first, we might think this is a charging offensive foul, but from second angle, you're gonna see clearly that uh, blue, uh, that uh, 15 moved in the path of blue 15. Let's try this. We'll see it from the same angle and then a different angle. And you can appreciate that there, there was space and the contact was done. There was space for blue 10 to pass and he has the ball. So if white 15 wants to have a legal guarding position, he needs to cover the path completely or move himself outside of there. Uh, unless he doesn't move at all, if the player doesn't move at all, then it's clear that he gave time and distance for a, a blue 10 to stop his uh, wheelchair. Let's see it again. See, white 15 is saying he's not moving. It's possible that he was stopped when the contact occurred, but he did not cover the path completely. See, he just gave an extra little push to come and try to cover the path of the player. So in this case, it's a clear example that the breaking distance was not correct. So it's a correct call by uh, the official. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, just to, just to uh, uh, reiterate what Seb said about the, about the player with the ball, right? In wheelchair basketball, they're at risk the most out of anyone only because uh, they're trying to they're trying to dribble and also protect uh, themselves and uh, and and uh, and their chair and that. So always keep that in mind. And wheelchair basketball, which is totally different than than FIBA basketball, because the, the ball handler in FIBA basketball is usually the one that's the biggest offensive threat because they have the ball. So a big difference between uh, the two uh, with uh, IWBF and FIBA. Perfect, we'll continue. Uh, in the next video, we'll focus again on the legal guarding push it, position that is not achieved by red 15 in order to stop white 12 with the ball. Any contact is the responsibility of the defender because he failed to gain a legal guarding position. 
slide 25. See, it started with a head-on collision that we're not gonna see today, but then he changed direction into the path of uh, the opponent. I'll play it again. So now they're coming head to head, but whoops, sorry. See, he doesn't cover the path, he creates contact and white 12 has the ball. So it's clearly a blocking foul for not covering the path of the opponent. Okay, next slide. Okay, in this slide, we have blue 12 who covers the path of white nine. We see that uh, blue 12 has covered, has gained a legal guarding position. And you'll see in the video that we're gonna see next that uh, blue 12 covers the path real quickly. It doesn't need to be sideways. It can be facing the opponent. The important thing is that he covers the path. Also, one thing to remember, we see the, the semicircle here. This does not apply to wheelchair basketball because there are no airborne players in wheelchair basketball. Therefore, any contact inside here is, uh, we don't, we don't uh, for, uh, for officials or people looking at able body basketball, it's a different rule, but for us, we don't use it. Okay. We see here, white nine must decide either to continue on his path and gamble, or whether he could reach the spot first before blue 12, or whether he should break or change direction to avoid contact. He decides to continue. Instead of breaking, he continues. He creates contact. Even though it's close to the basket, we don't have the semicircle rule. So this is uh, uh, an offensive foul by uh, white nine. The next one we're going to see, OK? I want you to look at uh, red five tries to cut in and shoot while the defender tries to achieve a legal guarding position by covering her path. Okay, take a close look if the path is covered or not. We'll see it a couple of times. Was the path covered? Okay, we had the old saying by players and uh, referees also that uh, you cannot cover the path of a player if the player is shooting and he has the ball in, in his hands. This is nowhere in the rule book, okay? A player that's going towards the basket, if she decides to shoot in this circumstance and contact occurs after, it can still be called an offensive foul or a pushing foul after the release of the ball, which would uh, be a shooting foul if there's a, a bonus situation the other side. But there's nothing in the rule, again, that says that uh, until the follow through is completed, that the hand is down, that they regain possession of their wheels, that uh, you cannot cover the, the path of a player. The only rule in the rule book is covering the path of the player with the ball or without the ball. Okay, in the next video, we see that uh, those rules, they apply anywhere on the court, okay? It doesn't have to be uh, right under the basket. It can be anywhere. Blue six covers the path of white four at center, therefore creates an offensive foul. We're, we're gonna see many, many times the, the video, so you can have a, 
good look at it. We see that uh, blue comes in and crosses the path on converging paths at a 90 degree angle and contact are on the big wheels. And especially the player, the white player's path is very small to, uh, to cover because his wheelchair is smaller maybe than other players. So we need to take all of that into consideration when we make the call. Okay, we'll now see a guarding a player who does not have the ball. We'll see that the rules are different for a player with or without the ball. If a defender wishes to take a legal position to guard an opponent who does not control the ball, he has only to occupy that position before the opponent. Very big difference. No need to cover the path of the player. You just need to be there first. Uh, so who gets there first is the big thing we ask our referees to look at when there's no ball involved. Uh, we see uh, many, many situations. We can see crossing the path without the ball. Uh, we can see screening, we're going to see later crossing the path, we're going to see later screening, add-on collision, pivoting, stationary defender that means in the path. That's all situation that we that can happen, but right now we're only talking about uh, converging paths and a player what to cover him. Uh, if, I don't know if my English is good enough to understand this. It's uh, <clears throat> the fact that uh, we're not looking at add-on collision or a player that moves in a path and another player. It's really, you don't need to cover the converging paths completely, okay? I want to focus on that right now. So we see here, eight is moving backwards, all right? Uh, red eight and blue five are on converging, converging path. Blue five runs into the side of red eight. So the official must decide who got there first. If the contact is on the side of the wheelchair, this means that eight got there first. So since blue five does not have the ball, it cannot be a foul on red eight. That's good. We see here, <clears throat> white 14 and blue seven, okay? Uh, white 14 and blue seven, they are on converging paths. The official must decide who gets there first. Even though a big contact can occur and sometimes it would look like blue seven made the foul because, the, because of the way maybe 14 would jump out of bounds. The referee must clear his mind and only look who got there first. There are, they are in converging paths. So that's the only thing he needs to look at in order to make a correct decision. We're going to see the same thing in the next video, white 14 and blue 7. Okay, like I've said, take a look at blue 7 and uh, white 14 and uh, we'll see what happened after. See, they are in converging paths. Blue seven, the contact is on his, the side of his chair. But the referee decides to call a foul on blue seven. Okay. We all make mistakes. I've done it several times in the past. I hope never to do it again. But uh, this is clearly a... Uh, misunderstanding by the referee, okay? We have blue seven that is in great defensive position and white that wants to go through him to pass in front. This needs to be called 
uh, a no call probably on this. No foul needs to be called on this. Just uh, play on because there's no advantage gain. The player's out of bounds. He will come back inside, so he loses time on his offense. So it should uh, stay like this. Next video. Sure looks like uh, white 15 pushed or white 14, sorry. Uh, no, it's 15. Okay, white 15 and red six on coveraging paths. Here we can think that white 15 did something wrong because red six went flying all over the place. But if we look at it again and we stop and we apply the principle, white 15 had the right to be there because he was there first because red six does not have the ball. That's the very important thing. The ball is next to him. So there's nothing, white 15 is not setting a screen. White 15 is going in front of uh, red six. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is probably one of the most difficult uh, principles uh, for the referees uh, to learn and master because you see all the contact and, of course, the players and coaches see all this contact. But if we, if we follow the principles of it, uh, yes, there's a lot of contact, but uh, sometimes that player that uh, is, is converging without the ball and, and, and going in a straight line, they have done nothing wrong, uh, although the contact seems uh, uh, tremendous. Uh, it's, uh, I would say, uh, and I think Seb would agree, and probably most of the referees, this is by far the, the hardest principle to learn as a, as a referee. Yes, of course. That's why we need to take uh, a, a, any other equation out of the, any other things you see out of the equation and concentrate really at who, who gets there first. That's how you make your decision and you need to decide which principle. We'll see uh, uh, the last four clips of this presentation. We'll see if you make the right call on uh, those, uh, those video we're gonna uh, show you. Let's now see the third principle that is very, very important for me. It's the screening. Okay, in order to call a screening opportunity uh, correctly, the referee has uh, two things to look at. Uh, it's, well, first of all, screening is the action of an offensive player who position his wheelchair in a stationary position near an opponent in an effort to prevent that opponent from reaching the desired position on the floor. There's two types of screen. You can do a screen on a stationary opponent. In this circumstance, you can set your screen as close as you want, short of contact. And the, screeners will uh, the, the screener must be stationary. The second thing that can happen is that you're going to screen on a moving opponent. This is one of the hardest place to referee. You must you must cover the path or give time and distance. A little like if the player had the ball. So the referee has to go in between uh, two principles here. The guy doesn't have, the guy or the player doesn't have the ball. And there's a, there's a, sorry, I got disturbed there. And, and he doesn't have the ball, but he has to apply the principle of a player with the ball. So for a young official, those are very, very difficult to apply. We see here in this example, orange seven sets a screen on white seven with stationary. Orange seven fails to stop short of contact, creating an advantage for her team, okay? This it's called an illegal screen. It's the same uh, for the referee. It's the same signal as a blocking uh, defensive foul. We're going to see that. Uh, remember that uh, in wheelchair basketball, the field of vision is not important. In AB basketball, 
you can, if you set a screen outside the field of vision, you need to give a meter to the player, a meter or two, depending on the uh, speed. But uh, in wheelchair basketball, this is not a factor. You can go as close as, close as you want. Let's here look at this player here that's going to set a screen if she's stationary when she makes a contact with uh, the opponent. So we can see we're going to look at it again. Doing the screen, she initiates contact, creating an advantage to her and her team. This action should be called an illegal screen. You see that she gained a big advantage because she wasn't stopped. She ran on the player, and then she turns and she gets the ball and she goes uh, to score or to shoot at the basket. So this is an example where the screen was set and it was supposed to be stationary and it wasn't. So it should have been called a uh, foul by the referee. The other example we're gonna see it's on a moving player. Okay, uh, in this little uh, slide, we see uh, white 15 is a moving defender trying to keep up with red seven. Red 11 sets a screen without giving the defender time to avoid contact or by covering the path. Okay, remember white 15 does not have the ball, but since he's moving, he has to be considered like a player with the ball. So in this case, we see a red 11 that covered the path here, we see. So it would have been a legal uh, play on, the, on here, okay? But he must be stationary. If he still moves forward, it's different. We see uh, the angle of uh, red 11 is not uh, 90 degrees or less uh, or more. So in this case, uh, red 11 was still moving when contact occurred. So we have a blocking foul. We can have an, a, the example right here. Oops, I moved back. See here. See, he's coming to do a screen. But he moves in the path of white 15. He must be stationary in order to set a screen. If you move, even though you just a little bit outside the cylinder, it gives an advantage to, uh, to your offense. Let's look at it again. Perfect. Let's see another example. See, just a little contact by white seven. See, he follows, he wants to do a screen and he goes and creates contact on the red, uh, on the, the blue player. So this is clearly a small contact, but gives a big advantage because now the black player cannot follow the guy he was guarding. So that's a great call by the official. Let's now take a look at the last principle we're going to look at today, crossing the path. Okay, this is also a hard principle to understand for new referees. And sometimes uh, they need to focus a little more to understand it. In order to cross path legally, the player must get his rear axle in front of the opponent. So we talked about rear axle in front of the most forward part of the opponent. In this, in this little picture, we see it. So it would be able to cross in front. 
he must also allow time and distance to the opponent. So he, even though he's right in front, he cannot cross in the path of the opponent real, real uh, at a steep angle because he would create all the contact. So that's two things he needs to, to, to understand. And this concept is the same with or without the ball. So at least when you look at this type of situation, you don't have to have one principle if the guy has the ball and another principle if the girl doesn't have the ball. All right. So this is at least simplified by this action. So if a player crosses the path legally, all contact is the responsibility of the opponent. Okay, let's see a little uh, demonstration here of a legal crossing the path. We see that blue seven is now as his rear axle in advance. So he's allowed to start his movement to cross in front. So if contact would occur, white seven would be responsible for the contact. So we saw boat seven. We'll see them again right here. Okay, before crossing the path in front of white seven, blue seven has his rear axle in front of the most forward point of the chair. Blue seven crosses the path legally and contact occurs. White seven is responsible for the contact and he's called for a foul. So the white player said, there, yes, go ahead. I uh, had a question on this. I know these, this is an old video, but uh, someone said, could this be uh, a potential uh, uh, U foul also, uh, or just the speed of it was just too quick for a uh, reaction? I think just the speed of it was too quick. And uh, when he, judging by the reaction if it could have been it could have been the player had not started his uh, action towards the basket so if there was nobody between the two uh, maybe but uh, crossing the path is a normal basketball foul so sometimes it creates a harder contact but crossing the path again is a normal wheelchair basketball play so uh, we don't want to call often uh, crossing the path as the unsportsmanlike fall, unless we use a, a criteria for excessive contact or if we judge that the player is not uh, playing the ball at all, which is the case in wheelchair basketball. He was playing position and he got cut in behind. So the referee, I, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't see if he, if he was shooting or not. Let's see again. So we can Sounds ask. Good. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay. Next slide. We'll see now an illegal crossing the path. We see red five is not in front. His rear axle is not in front of white nine. And he's attempting to cross into the path of white nine too early before getting in front. When contact occur, there is a disadvantage for white nine. See in this example, sometimes referees could say, oh, if uh, uh, white uh, red five has the ball, well, we're gonna give uh, the uh, advantage to a red five because he has the ball. But the principle is the same with or without the ball. So the referee needs to make the correct decision. In this case, we'd have called the offensive foul on the red five if he has the ball, or simply a defensive foul if he doesn't have the ball and he's playing white nine. Uh, red five and white nine. 
we'll see here in this play. Those are the player here. We're on slide 47 for, any, for anyone that's um, uh, going through the list. Start. We'll see it multiple times, all right? See, they started at parallel, but then she decides to cut in front of white. Let's see here. Oh, the video stopped. See, right here, she has her path here, and red wants to cross in front of her path. But her axle is not in front of the most forward part of the white player. That's why. It's a crossing the path foul. Did I go back? Yes, I did. Huh? Okay, in this next situation, uh, we have uh, two parallel paths going towards the basket. White 15 wants to cross in the path of red 10, who has the ball on a fast break. Again, like we've said before, this could be an unsportsmanlike, but it's clearly a crossing the path of a foul. Oops, it started too far. We'll start again. See? At this point, you have to judge, the referee has to judge if uh, white 15 is legitimately trying to cross path or just making contact for a, to avoid a, a player from scoring. So it's the referee that would decide that, but he needs to understand the crossing the path situation. Okay, uh, here we go. Illegal crossing offense, okay? Let's see that, white seven and red 10. We see that the axle is not in advance and in the next video that you're gonna see, you'll see that white seven wants to go and score. This is something coaches teaches their players to do, to create contact, shoot, fall on the floor, and if the referee calls a foul, good. If not, at least the basket is in. So uh, that's a, a good thing to know. So it creates contact. So white seven rear axle was not in front of the red 10. So if an advantage is created, again, for a referee to call a foul, there needs to be an advantage created. This is a crossing the path. Offensive foul. Now we'll see this video where we see the same situation. Okay, whoops. Here we go. This play is common amongst players that want to draw a foul during an action to the basket. We see that red 10 even changes direction to further himself from white seven, but white seven still comes into red 10 in order to draw a foul. This is an illegal crossing the path by white seven and it creates an advantage. An offensive foul should have been called on white seven by the referee. Understood. Sometimes there are situations that don't create an advantage. Okay. We have blue 15 that has the ball, is not yet in uh, front of the white eight. But creates contact 
and then something happens, maybe he falls down like uh, Seven did just the video before. So if there's no advantage, there's no need to call a foul to the player, but we don't want to penalize eight for playing a superb defense in front of uh, blue 15. So the referee could do a no call on this. Let's see the video of that. We're going to see it many times so you can have a very good look at the situation. You see that uh, white eight has a good path and he continues. The slight movement that you see eight, white eight do is because a 15 enters in the back of his wheel, creating a little movement by white eight. But who initiates contact is blue 15. Therefore, the referee does a good job and has a no call on that because he loses the ball and he gives the ball to white. Okay. In the next video, we'll have a mul multiple legal crossing the path by defender white 34 on the ball carrier black 3. After black releases the ball, white 34 still legally crosses the path of black 3 in order to keep him far from the offense. We call that a back pick in wheelchair basketball. It's hard to catch on camera and I'm really gagged. We have an example here because it happens often for uh, in the wheelchair basketball. You see white 34 crosses the path again, again in front. And when he sees you hear uh, one of his player here release, he goes in, in offense and puts the ball in so that this was an effective back pick. I'll play it again in, ca in case the video was uh, not going too well. So we can have another look at it. Everything that 34 did in this uh, play was completely legal. There was contact two, three times with uh, the offensive player, but every time he had covered the path and he was there in, the, in front of the player. So he had legally a legal position on the floor. Let's see now if you can determine the principle involved and the appropriate call by the official in the next four videos. Okay, there's going to be a poll coming out after the video to ask you if A, you think that the player gets there first or it's a situation of screening situation. Again, uh, when a play happens in a game, the referee has to decide quickly if he's calling a screen or who gets there first. Because if you followed from the beginning of the presentation, there are two different rules. If he's covering a screening player, you need to, and the player is moving, it's a screening situation, you need to cover completely the path and you need to be stationary. But if you're only placing your wheelchair at a better spot on the floor, you only, you only have to get there first. So let's see the video and you tell us after what you think. Sean is going to go ahead and uh, put the uh, survey up uh, after we watch this, and then uh, uh, we'll give a few seconds to, for everyone to vote of what uh, of what you see here uh, uh, between uh, number uh, <clears throat> excuse me number fifteen and number twelve here. Okay, I'll play it again, and again, look at the situation. Do you think it's uh, who gets there first because? A red 12 wants to go to the hoop and go closer or red 12 in this case trying to set a screen that needs to be stationary uh, by the call by the official probably the official thought red 12 was setting a screen but let's see what you think
See, white 15 is defending red 15. And white, uh, red 12 is maybe doing a screen or maybe not in this situation. Did, is the poll uh, working? Here we go. So, so it's the, it's so, the first, first question. Yes, slide 55. And, uh, and uh, Seb, there's also a question about that. Uh, uh, I'll read the question uh, also. Uh, what's the definition of screening? How can referees determine it's a screen and not just a, a movement on the floor? Uh, this is a good question. That's why I've put this video inside here. Uh, a screen is usually very easy to see uh, because the purpose of the screen is to get somebody free. If the player can get himself at a better position, it's probably not a screening situation. In this example with red uh, 12 here, for my angle, from what I see here, I would have not called a foul on red 12. Maybe stop the play because 15 was on the floor, but I would not uh, have called a, a violation. Let's see it again, okay? So yes, 12 wants to get there first, but see the ball is on the other side of the key. And if 12 continue, he can have a fair chance to grab the ball because he doesn't stop. He just wants to get there in front. Because if we apply the principle of if 12 is doing a moving screen, a screen, he has to cover completely the path of white 15 because white 15 is moving or be uh, give him time and distance to stop. In this case, he doesn't give time and distance, but I don't think he's screening is probably going in, a, in, a, in a, the same path as uh, two converging paths. So in this case, who gets there first? 12 is there first. But if the referee consider that he's setting a screen again, this is an illegal screen. So that's in the vision of the referee to decide. In this case, we see that the referee decided to go with a screen because it's possible also because 15, is guarding red 15 here. So this is, yes, he's cutting, but it's also a screen because 15 can come here. And if eight decides to guard 12, but 15 is gonna be alone underneath here. And this is why, this is why we love wheelchair basketball. It's uh, <laughs> just something, something uh, like this one situation, there's lots of, uh, lots of probabilities and uh, that's what makes this game so much fun but so difficult to, uh, to referee. To referee uh. <laughs> Here we go. In this video, you have to decide if you agree with the official for a crossing the path foul. Did orange seven change direction to make contact or we talk about two converging paths? So A, you're gonna answer crossing the path, B, converging paths. Orange seven must cover the path of white seven or give her time and distance in order to fulfill the obligation of the converging path rule. It's not the same rule for a crossing the path. Take a look. All right, let's look at it. We'll see a different angle. See, white seven changes a little bit or the, uh, the direction of her chair, but it's orange that has to uh, correct her chair as well because uh, they're on converging paths. So even though she gets there first, a rear axle is in front. We're not uh, talking about uh, crossing the path. We're talking about converging paths probably. <laughs> we'll see next one. Or you wanna put the The poll. So we're talking about slides 56. What principle are we judging in this action? 
which principle okay. which principle are involved when judging this contact blue eight and white five take a look Are we talking crossing the path or who gets there first? And would your decision be the same one or the other? Let's take a look again. So we have to, when judging this contact, nobody has the ball. So it helps Crossing the path is the same with or without the ball. And converging paths, it's not, uh, it, it's really a big difference. So you can make your decision on this one as well. The last one we're going to look at. Okay, here we go. What principle is involved? Guarding a player with the ball or without the ball? This is a real tough one. You're gonna look at it. We're gonna look at it many times. And you see hey, how a fraction of a second can make a difference in your decision. Hey, hey Seth, just a question yes. here on the last one, on the yes. slide 57, crossing the path or who gets there first on the previous one? Uh, the previous one, yes, go ahead. Yeah, it crossing the path or who gets there first on slide 57. Oh, uh, I believe it's who gets there first, but probably you would have the same decision with crossing the path. But it's clear so the that the answers could be the same. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's a, yes, potentially. That's a, the, a one that you have to identify. But luckily, it's the same the same answer for both both files. Right. Okay, the last one. Take a look closely. A fraction of a second. Decide if it's a foul on offense or defense. Let's look at it. So if we think that white eight is a player with the ball, we must cover the path or give time and distance. Decision would be blocking foul on blue 11. But if we decide that the player is without uh, white eight, does not have the ball, it's who gets there first. Therefore, this would be a charge call on white eight. It's a split second. Let's look at it again. Now that you know, and you make the decision. Sometimes we tell our officials that they need to have a good angle to see when contact occurs if the player got the ball before contact, after contact, it's very, very important. Because now, as you realize, if white eight started contact with blue 11 before catching the ball, then it's an offensive foul on white eight. But if he got the ball before blue 11 contacts him, then it's a blocking foul. In this case, the referee decided that white eight did not receive the ball before making contact with the blue 11, which is really a split second to decide. Let's look at it from this angle. See, from this angle, oops, I'll try to stop it. See that contact occur before it's like a fraction of a second, because if it happened, the first contact happens before that Joey Johnson gets the ball, then it's the correct call, it's an offensive foul. If he gets the ball, so to me, it's a 50-50 call, but we do need a call on a big contact like this in the key. That's what we tell our officials. Sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're right, but uh, that's the way it goes. Again, keep in mind, uh, these decisions are, are made in a split second. We have the luxury now of watching this one video probably a dozen times here, deciding what the right call might or might not be in that. But um, 
uh, whether it's the players, the coaches, or referees uh, out there, uh, these are split second uh, split second decisions. And uh, like Seb said, sometimes the referees are going to get them right, and uh, and sometimes uh, they're going to get them uh, they're going to get them wrong based on the principles. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Uh, we do those webinar with officials before tournament. Uh, uh, this year we did three during COVID so that everybody thinks about wheelchair basketball as we go. Our objective when we do those, uh, those webinars is to have a global standard to make sure that we try to call it from one ocean to the other, one continent to the other. It's a very diffic difficult things to do, thing to do, but we're trying and trying to get the same message across the Americas for us right now, and to call this the same, the same, the same everywhere. Uh, I would like to thank again, uh, Sean Liebich from uh, Wheelchair Basketball Canada. Without him assisting us in giving this uh, webinar, it would have been impossible. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Sergio Giordano for his help preparing this uh, presentation. I really uh, am really grateful for Sergio for helping me presenting this, uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, to Orge Basiliero for asking me to do such a thing. It's a lot of work, but it's uh, really, I think it's, uh, the, for me, it's the first time I'm uh, able to give a clinic to players, coaches, uh, referee at the same time. I know that uh, Mike in Toronto have asked me uh, many times to come and do clinics, but I couldn't make it over there to players and uh, coaches. And hopefully we can go forward and giving uh, more webinars on different topics uh, so that wheelchair basketball evolves in the right way uh, with great calls and with player improving with the way we call the game.